Well, yesterday we talked about a uh, defense and run game oriented NFC South team with a mid 20s power score that finished 7 and 10. And today we're talking about a defense and run oriented NFC South team with a mid 20s power score that went 7 and 10. Yeah, it's a photocopy. <laughs> Same division, different colors, different city, different fan base for sure. We're not trying to conflate, conflate the two, but. Uh, NFC South last year was <laughs> one team that won eight games and three teams that won seven. And they all hate each other. <laughs> it's a wonderful week here on Bootleg Football. Uh, lots to talk about with the Saints today. But before we do that, Jay, roll the intro. Nobody gives the New Orleans Saints a chance this year, uh, and there are some reasons for that. But I, I kind of feel like the pendulum has swung a little too far the other way, where people assume that New Orleans is going to be like a bottom seven to eight team. Uh, that also seems relatively impossible to me. Uh, very similar to the Falcons, they are solid right down the middle of the fairway in the NFL. They could beat anybody and be beaten by anybody. That would put them mid-pack, not bottom, and I'm with you. I think there's some things that we'll talk about today that people might not be aware of because they stopped paying attention to the Saints Oh, right before Christmas last year. There were some good things that happened for them in the back half of the season. Obviously, we'll talk about all the additions and changes like we normally do. Some of those are kind of a big deal, and while folks might not like the one right at the top, um, it's better than what they had. Yeah, I mean... They had Andy Dalton last year for 14 of those games and still went 7-10. and 10. Have to imagine Derek Carr, regardless of how you feel about Derek Carr, still better than Andy Dalton. Yes. And the defense is still good, and the offensive line on paper is still just fine. And, you know, they got a million running backs, and Chris Olave is a superstar in the making. Like, there's there's a lot of good going on in New Orleans. I, I feel fairly positive about them. Now, do I expect them to challenge, like, the Eagles for top of the NFC? No. But... By God, this is not a bad football team. No, I don't think bad is a word we're going to be using for the 2023 Saints. Like you said, the 2022 Saints, 7-10 and 10 with Andy Dalton. Like, that's the big asterisk, right? You still want 7-10 and 10 despite the Andy Dalton factor, which is, you know, if we're going to slander Andy Dalton, it's late in his career. We're not talking about early career Andy Dalton because he's not there anymore. Um, third in the division, but... Were they really? Because they had the same number of wins as the second place team and the fourth place team. Home record four and five, road record three and five, last five games three and two, which again is probably after a lot of people, including Saints fans, we understand the mercy rule, turned off the TV and stopped watching the Saints. So one of those teams that had enough of a flourish at the end of last year that we feel fairly positive, at least about their defense moving into 2023, and they made a very significant move on offense. So I think that gives us hope going into this season more so than maybe some people would think. What I uh, found interesting, not to you know swoop in on, on the effectiveness summary here, because um, I, was, I was looking at Andy Dalton's numbers, and again, spoiler alert, he, he actually had some intriguing numbers, I would say, as an explosive passer, stuff that I didn't quite expect. But then, you know, the, the total yardage was low and the EPA was low and everything like that. And I was like, okay, well, why why was the deep ball efficiency good and uh, while the total was bad and the EPA was mid, like literally dead in the middle of the NFL? Yeah. And I was like, oh, they were 12th in run pass ratio. They ran the ball 46% of the time. Like they, they kind of protected Dalton from having to throw too much last year. Uh, and yet at the same time, despite being 12th in run pass ratio, they were 29th in rushing EPA. Uh, what I'm trying to say here is the Saints were the football equivalent of running into a brick wall over and over and over again, hoping that eventually you break through. And they kind of didn't. So we'll talk about the effectiveness summary that we've mentioned a couple of times. New thing this year on the team previews. Uh, we're breaking it down based on EPA per play, which is a stat we both really like in terms of offense and defense, further breaking it down with rushing offense, passing offense, EPA of rush defense, EPA of pass defense, i.e. coverage, then points scored and points allowed because that's the name of the game. You score more points than your opponent in the NFL, you're going to win. You don't, you're not. Rushing offense, here's the brick wall, 29th. 
Not a good number, but they kept doing it a lot. 12th most in the NFL. Passing offense, dead middle, 17th. And again, with all the Andy Dalton slander that we've already thrown out, you might think, oh, I expected that to be a lot lower. They were efficient when they did it. They just didn't do it a lot or enough, yeah, maybe. E- Efficient-ish, yeah. you know. <laughs> they weren't terrible. As efficient as they could hope to be, yeah. In terms of rush defense, again, it mashes up, mashes up, meshes up with the rush offense a little bit. They were 22nd. They could stop the run, kind of, mostly, Yeah. sometimes. It, it, they were very good at limiting explosives, but they weren't very good at limiting like first down gains, which have a, a pretty significant weight towards EPA. Because if you get a like a five yard carry on first down, your odds of converting uh, the third down go way up, and the more you convert third downs, the more expected points you add. It's it's a bunch of analytics like stuff that I I am not smart enough to explain. But what I do know is that. Uh, successful rushes on early downs that don't result in tackles for loss uh, are are very significantly weighted in EPA, and the Saints were not super great at stopping those. I won't say that it's the analytics version of momentum because that's a whole. I mean, podcast. it kind of is, yeah. though. You know, I fully understand. Um, in terms of pass defense, fourteenth. Again, not bad, and it's really interesting to see how locked those numbers are. Rushing offense, 29th. Rushing defense, 22nd. Passing offense, 17th. Passing defense, 14th. So very much in lockstep on both sides of the ball, just not with each other. Points scored, they scored 330 points. That was good for 22nd in the league. Again, not a great number. Um, It's going to be tough to win more games than they did, only scoring that many points. And they allowed 345, but that was good for ninth in the league. They were the ninth best scoring defense in the league. And I think if you asked a lot of people, hey, do you think New Orleans was a top 10 scoring defense in 2022? They'd say, no, no. The Saints, they only won seven games. They were absolutely a top 10 scoring defense under head coach Dennis Allen in 2022. And more importantly, a top five red zone defense, which obviously contributes a lot to scoring defense, but they only allowed touchdowns on 50% of red zone trips against them. Uh, the only teams that were better were Baltimore at 48%, Jets at 47 Buffalo at 45 and, and the Rams, oddly enough, at 44 I know that one. That is <laughs> odd. That one uh, kind of took me by surprise. But yeah, New Orleans, top five red zone defense. So if you can limit people to field goals, your points allowed is going to be pretty good. So we take those six numbers, their league ranks against their peers and all those categories, add them up, divide by six. That gives us a bootleg power score of 19. Not bad, not great, which is the theme of this episode. And that ranks 24th best in power scores as we stack them for the entire league. So that number's not great. That's starting to creep into that bottom third where it felt like they played a lot of their games in 2022 and sort of more matches the eye test, which in my book is just another sort of uh, check mark on power score works. Uh, for the record, by the way, that's one spot ahead of the Falcons. So don't worry, Saints fans. <laughs> you beat Atlanta. You're power still score. winning. <laughs> uh, looking at scheme information here, speaking of the defense, which was uh, good for them last year. They are a very man coverage heavy defense. They were fourth in calling zero. They were fourth in calling cover one, which is man coverage across the board, single high safety. Uh, Most common cover one call you're going to get is one rat, where it's basically both linebackers are banjoing on the running back. Everybody else is on an island, single high post safety. Um, They were 18th in cover two, not a whole lot of cover two. They were 31st in cover three. Uh, remember how I said that they were not super great at stopping first down runs. Well, uh, a lot of teams that are great in terms of early down run defense go heavy into cover three because cover three is, uh, I don't want to say the best way to fit the run, but certainly the most efficient way to fit the run because everybody's eyes are in the backfield. You typically have an extra guy in the box, you know, the safety is there to help, uh, Teams that are low in cover three don't typically care about early down runs. So, again, just adds a little bit of extra context there. They were seventh in quarters, which oftentimes quarters ends up playing out kind of like man coverage anyway. So, again, kind of fits their motif. Uh, They were 28th in quarter, quarter half, and third in cover five, also known as two man. So, again, this is a defense that believed heavily in their corners. 
And when you have the corners that they do, I I don't particularly blame them. I think they actually have a a very good secondary. Uh, there are some young guys that we hope to keep improving and keep developing. Um, but you know, when you have Marshawn and and you've got the safeties that they've got, I I think that this defense plays into their strengths personally. Their reliance on man is. Yes, leaning into players they have. It's not misplaced. They say, we've drafted these guys for a reason. They play a certain way. We're going to play that way and use it as a lever. Whereas some teams are trying to play coverages that they don't have the players for. We've talked about quite a few of those in this series so far. The Saints are sort of on the other end of that spectrum. They do have the guys to run this system. They like running it. They run it well. And they lean really heavily into it those numbers are extremely high um, for some of the the coverages that they like the most and look they're really good at it this is the part that I mentioned earlier in the podcast that New Orleans had a lot of success in the second half of last year that people I don't think I think people didn't see they weren't watching so our buddy Mina Kimes uh, put up a stat the other day on Twitter. Saints defense in the second half of last season, again, when a lot of people had stopped watching. Second in DVOA, first in yards per play, first in opponent's pass rating, that means lowest, and fourth in EPA per play. Yep. They dominated defensively in the second half of the year. So you can say what you want about the head coach. He knows how to call a defense, and they already had the guys to do it, and they made some additions. This is a reason for optimism moving into 2023. They were also a uh, very low blitz percentage team. Uh, They typically like to rush with four. Now, who those four are had a bunch of different variations (laughs) because they did like to send linebackers on, uh, you know, if you're a Dave Aranda aficionado, aficionado, you can call them creepers. Uh, You can call it simulated pressures where you're still sending four, but it's not the four you expect. Uh, they, They did do their fair share of those, but typically they were going to keep their rushers to four or fewer. They were 19th in uh, bringing pressure on third and short. They were 24th in bringing it on third and medium, and they were 25th in third and seven plus. Uh, They were also 27th in blitz or uh, in uh, overall stunt percentage as well. And looking at the front four that they had, uh, you know, again, starting in the back half of last year. They had Marcus Davenport, Shai Tuttle, David Onyemata, and uh, and Cam Jordan with a little sprinkling of Carl Granderson there uh, and a little bit of Peyton Turner in there as well. Uh, this year, it's, again, Carl Granderson, Colin Saunders, Nate Shepard, and still Cam Jordan with a little bit of Brian Bercy, a little bit of Isaiah Foskey, a little bit of Malcolm Roach, and also Peyton Turner there as well. So has been some turnover on the defensive line. Really intrigued to see if they keep trying to get home with four, considering a lot of those front four or a lot of the snaps they're going to get from their front four this year are very young players. They reinvested, and I'm most interested in that second slate of guys, what we would consider the first substitutes, the first folks to rotate in. And a lot of those guys are young. They got Tano Passignon, but Brian Bercy and Foskey came this year. Malcolm Roach is an absolute stump in the middle of the defense there. That's your sort of second unit rotating in. And while the first four might not wow you outside of an aging Cam Jordan, who's still, you know, very effective, and Colin Saunders, who we like and mentioned as a, you know, primary free agent ad coming over from the Chiefs, it's really how that second unit develops because currently in the NFL, you've got to come in waves. Those guys can't play. None of those guys can play 750, 800, 850 snaps in a season. You've got to keep those numbers down. And that means that second wave of rotation of some young fire breathers that they invested in, which is very much along the sort of historical arc for New Orleans and personnel is we're going to invest heavily in the lines, both of them, offensive and defensive. They did that this year. And I'm really interested to see how some of those guys and even Peyton Turner, who's down currently in the third string, Another guy we like this year, Jerron Cage, gets added. Um, these are all you know, rotational pieces, but I want to see how they contribute to that particular piece of the rushes. If you're going to come with four, are those guys going to be able to bring some early pressure and upset opposing offenses? Flipping over to the offensive side, in terms of run concept frequency, uh, you know, how were they so bad at running the ball? Like, What, what were they <laughs> focusing on last year? They were 13th in outside zone, so 
slightly above average there. They were 21st in inside zone, 19th in duo, second in power. The only team in the entire NFL who ran power more than the Saints was Baltimore. Shocker, I know. No. Uh, <laughs> they were 15th in counter, 8th in draw, 20th in pin and pull. So again, if if they were leaning on anything, it was outside zone and power, uh, which is not a combination that you see super often no. uh, in the NFL. Um, obviously, didn't go their way last year. I I really want to go back and do some offseason film study to find out why they weren't great at running the ball. Because on paper, the offensive line should have been able to run block fairly. Like, they have a gigantic fucking offensive line. You know, their running backs last year are not as good as their running backs this year. I'll be diplomatic and say it that way. But I I still don't understand how the Saints of all teams were 29th in, in rushing EPA. So that's a film study project for myself. But I just want to lay out the stats there of what they leaned into or rather tried to lean into and mostly failed. I feel like we're a little bit like the National Transportation Safety Board. What do you mean? We show up in these episodes at the scene of the crash and go, <laughs> why did this occur? What did you do wrong to end up in this smoking heap of rushing EPA? And then go back to the film and the black box and everything else and go, oh, yeah, that's why. Um, but it is interesting to see because, again, looking at how they've invested over time in the offensive line, the size of those guys, the skill of those guys, and who they had at running back, you would think, yeah, they should do it a lot. Just like the defense leans into man coverage because they have the guys to do it. The offense leans into these runs because they have the guys to do it. But the overall end result for the offense wasn't as good as the overall end result for the defense. Zeroing in on Andy Dalton, uh, we mentioned this a little bit earlier, how, uh, again, they were 12th in run pass ratio overall, which kind of limited uh, the amount of passes he was even throwing, hence his total yardage being down. And even though Andy was not great, uh, he was certainly more efficient, especially as a deep ball thrower, than I expected last year. And I do kind of wonder if maybe they would have won a couple more games if they... If rather not even let Andy, if they let Olave work a little yeah. bit more for attributing actual credit here. Um, but he was seventh in average depth of target. He was third in air yards percentage, meaning the percentage of his passing yards that came through the air rather than after the catch. He was 10th in yards per attempt. He was sixth in big time throw percentage. Uh, all while having the seventh fastest average time to throw, by the way, like on paper, those efficiency numbers look awesome. They do. The total yardage just wasn't great because they didn't throw that often. Um, I did go back and watch a little bit of film on the passing game because, again, you expect somebody with those numbers to be more than, like, 17th in, in passing EPA and everything like that. Um, again, it's a, it's a more – it's more about explosiveness over efficiency. Um, or rather, that's a bad way to phrase it. It's more about efficiency on the explosive passes rather than the efficiency of doing everything else, if that makes sense. It does. As in, when he was throwing down the field to Olave and getting those big chunks, it's awesome. And that's where you get you know the average depth of target. Mm -hmm. That's where you get the air yards percentage. That's where you get the big time throw percentage. It, I'm not used to seeing Andy Dalton being better 15 yards plus past the line of scrimmage, but last year he was. Everything under 15 yards... That's where you saw misplaced passes that didn't set up good yak opportunities. You saw three uh, screen passes thrown wide and incomplete. Um, you saw a few pretty egregious sacks taken. Mm. Uh, it was it was kind of like bizarro Andy Dalton, right? Uh, and maybe that's why they focused more on running the ball than anything else, just because they felt like he was a hindrance on the quick game. And we're used to him not being a hindrance on the quick game. We're used to him excelling in the quick game and being a hindrance on the deep ball. So I don't know. It was kind of a weird, a weird year for for Andy Dalton. And those particular numbers, which we pull for every single team, look great. And it took until me going back and watching the film and watching the non-explosive passes where I realized, like, oh, now I kind of get it. He was not great. 
Devil's in the details of those things, which is why you can't just look at any number. I don't care whether it's offensive, defensive, passing, rushing, doesn't matter, and not go look at how that translates and passes the eye test on film. And Andy Dalton, a lot of fans would say, yeah, but you know, he made hay when he threw deep to Olave. Do that more. What I want to do is make a graph of efficiency on those explosives over number of explosives because there's a lot of diminishing returns with late career Andy Dalton, right? He might look good doing that eight times a game. He might look doing great doing that six times a game. But if you go, oh, well, that's where it's working. Just crank it up. Let's do it 22 times a game. Yeah. So it's not going to support an offense. And you need to do all the other things to support an offense. You need to be good in that short to medium game. You need to be efficient about not taking sacks and, and throwing it away, which is something I think he's actually regressed at. He's worse at that now than he was a few years ago in his career. So while he might be better at throwing down the numbers, some somewhat due to personnel that we really enjoy on this team, you can't just do that all the time. That that does not an offense make, right? Running into the wall 20 times a game and then whipping it down the field 20 times a game is not going to win you as many games as you think it might. With the one exception being Geno Smith, apparently. But other than that, <laughs> other than that, he's the only one that could make it work last year. I want to shift to the power structure now because uh, this has been a very stable power structure for a long time down New Orleans. One of the most stable in the entire NFL. Uh, we've seen a few different teams have uh, showrunners, so to speak, that are pushing two decades or more. Saints are one of them. Mickey Loomis has been there forever. And Dennis Allen, even though you know he hasn't been around as long as, say, Sean Payton was, He's still, still been there quite a while in his own right. Uh, first as defensive coordinator, now as head coach. Uh, I have to imagine at this point he's pushing a decade in the building between various roles. So, uh, again, these guys have all been around each other for a long, long time. So Mickey Loomis is the executive vice president and the GM for this team. One of the ultimate horse traders in the NFL as far as the salary cap is concerned. Every year we see a lot of people hue and cry. How can he do that? He's kicking the can down the road. He's been kicking the can down the road for two decades now. Knows how to do it better than just about anybody else. You mentioned Dennis Allen as the head coach, former defensive coordinator. I really want to talk about Pete Carmichael as the offensive coordinator because when you talk about longevity, this is his 15th year as the Saints offensive coordinator. Mm -hmm. I can't think of another scenario unless you want to call like Bill Belichick the defensive coordinator, which he kind of is where there's that amount of stability with a coordinator and one team. I mean, I, I guess, again, if we're talking about, like, offensive play calling head coaches, you know, the Sean McVay's, Kyle Shanahan's, well, really Andy's the only one that's been doing it that long. Like, I, I guess that's equivalent. But other than that, I mean, even then, you know, Sean was calling plays even when Pete was OC. But uh, in terms of having, like, one – offensive coach in the same offense for a decade and a half very rarely ever does that happen i don't even think i don't think andy was um in philly for 15 years was he i don't think he was if he was it was right there and it's amazing to see again um a coordinator level coach be in the same role with the same team for 15 years again i can't think of another Opportunity where that's occurred. Defensive coordinator, Joe Woods. It's his first year with the Saints. He spent the last three with Cleveland. And special teams coordinator, Darren Rizzi. Other notable coaches for the Saints. There are many. On offense, Doug Marone is the offensive line coach. 30 years of overall coaching experience. 10 as a head coach. Six of those as a head coach in the NFL. His 16th year in the NFL overall. Uh, coached offensive line at Bama in 2021. So visited the Nick Saban Rehabilitation Coaches Clinic um, of showing up at Bama for a year <laughs> and then getting another job, usually in the NFL. Ronald Curry is the pass game coordinator and QB coach. He's a former Tar Heel QB, played at UNC, also played point guard, played two years of basketball with uh, one Julius Peppers on the UNC team. Really? Yep. Interesting. He was a dual sport guy, huh. one of the sort of precursors of that. You know, when you say being a point guard as an offensive player at quarterback, he literally was the point guard on the UNC team. So uh, gets to help mold Derek Carr uh, into the new leader at QB that New Orleans has been looking for, or, or hopefully so. That's the role he's going to be tasked with for sure. 
And he's got Chris Lave to help with that transition. Again, being the both pass game coordinator and QB coach, he can pull those two together and say, you both get to listen to me. I'm both of your coaches. Let's play this one this way. Um, Clancy Barone's the tight end coach, 34 years of coaching experience. Just one of those coaches that's been around in the NFL, um, 17 in college football and now 17 in the NFL. So he's perfectly balanced there. And Jari Evans might sound familiar to a lot of Saints fans. He is the he is an offensive assistant, spent 11 years of his 12 year NFL career in New Orleans with the Saints. So that would be why that sounds like a familiar face. It is. Uh, we have another pass rush specialist coach on this team. New-ish title in the NFL. That's Brian Young. Um, played nine years in the NFL with the Rams and Saints, so if his name sounds familiar, that's why. And Marcus Robertson is the secondary coach. First year with the Saints after 15 years of coaching in the NFL. He was with Arizona last year. He had a 12-year career in the NFL on his own with the Oilers and Titans and then Seahawks at the end of his career. So lots of former players, lots of familiar faces, um, lots and lots and lots of experience on this staff. I was going to say, it's a, there are some staffs around the league where we see a whole bunch of you know either just over or just under 30-somethings you know, bright-eyed, bushy-tailed. Not so much with the Saints. <laughs> There's a lot of older guys, a lot of experience. But also, I think that's why they were kind of able to hold things together last year, make a playoff push with a roster that absolutely should not have been able to make a playoff push. But they did it because they have a lot of great coaches in and around that staff. Now, highlighting those offensive players specifically that will be under Ronald Curry and Pete, Mar- Pete Carmichael and all the others, uh, we, we have touched a little bit on... Chris Olave and how darn good he is, not just as a deep threat, but also, you know, really good at catching in traffic. A lot of guys his size, uh, I would not uh, say are as reliable in terms of catching the ball and getting immediately lit up. Uh, Olave is one of them. He is, uh, you know, I I liked him a lot coming out, uh, you know, in terms of which Ohio State guy that I would have staked my life on. I, I would have said Garrett Wilson, but if you look back at the end of last year when both were rookies, Garrett Wilson and Olave were pretty darn close to one another. And a lot of people would have even said Olave was even better than Wilson, who was the offensive rookie of the year. And I don't entirely disagree. Like, I, they are different. They are different players, absolutely. But in terms of, uh, in terms of value that they bring to their respective teams, I think Olave is just as valuable, if not more valuable to the Saints uh, than Wilson is to the Jets. Again, very rare that you see somebody with his deep ball ability that I also feel uh, is an absolute assassin over the middle. He's kind of a do-it-all type of guy. Superstar in the making. Uh, I had Olave over Garrett Wilson, but only barely. But of the two Ohio State wide receivers that came out in that draft, I liked Olave's skill set because of that versatility. I felt he was a little bit more well-rounded. Felt like Wilson was a little bit more explosive. That's kind of how it played out in their rookie seasons. But when you've got two guys from the same school playing the same position and they're the ones fighting it out for Offensive Rookie of the Year in the NFL, you're doing just fine, Brian Hartline. You're doing great. Keep keep churning them out, and we know you will. But I love Olave's versatility. I think he did get overlooked because of where he played, because of the quarterbacking situation. But he was fantastic as a rookie. And I think it says a lot that even with uh, Michael Thomas, maybe finally, possibly, hopefully, <laughs> being <laughs> healthy this year uh, and making his triumphant return and you know them having some other receivers around the, around the roster that we like, he is still far and away like clear wide receiver one on this team. And he's being drafted accordingly. Like if you look at fantasy rankings, he's going as wide receiver 12 overall. So... Uh, the fantasy community noticed how damn good he is, and they're drafting him accordingly. Uh, Michael Thomas, by the way, wide receiver, 47. I think we're in show-me phase with Michael Thomas at this point. Michael Thomas was really good for a long time. It's been a while. We've said this about several other players in this series. Like We know they have that potential. We know they have that ability, but the NFL is a what-have-you-done-for-me-lately league. And Michael Thomas has not done a lot lately, Um, certainly not to the level he did earlier in his career. So I think, you know, fantasy players as well are solidly in show me mode. Looking at the running backs, by the way, uh, (laughs) 
It's it's not often that you see a run heavy team where the highest drafted running back is going as running uh, running back thirty one. That's Alvin Kamara, largely because, um, to put it delicately, there are legal issues that we still don't have answers to, uh, and it's very possible that he either misses a significant chunk of the season, if not the whole season, uh, because if you've been keeping up with the trial. Camara uh, made a little bit of a legal boo-boo, as experts refer to it. <laughs> Is that a technical term? Legal boo-boo? And kind of uh, destroyed his own uh, self-defense case with his statements to police. So now he kind of has no case, and it's not looking great, uh, to say the least. So who knows if Alvin's even going to play this year. Uh, and then you got Kendra Miller, who they drafted. Uh, and we'll, we'll, we'll get to him. We'll expand on him more. Uh, when we talk about the, their draft class, but he and Jamal Williams are battling it out for ostensibly RB one A and RB one B on this team. I do not think that either one of them is going to, you know, have a huge, you know, percentage of uh, of touches over the other. Mm-hmm. But people are trying to figure out, okay, well, who is the lead back? Right? For me, if I had to guess right now, it's Jamal Williams. He's going as RB42. Kendry's going as RB44. So they're kind of going neck and neck while people figure this out. Uh, For me, personally, just based on what I watched from Kendry in college, I was more whelmed with him than a lot of other people who really like Kendry Miller. Uh, I think for now, Jamal Williams is the guy, especially if Alvin's out. And then maybe they kind of mix Kendry more in as the season goes on. But looking at all three of these guys, and all three of them are going very late in fantasy drafts, if I had to hitch my horse to one of them I would probably say Jamal Williams uh, just out of an abundance of caution and he feels like a little bit of a value because there is this uncertainty he is the veteran we're talking about veteran versus rookie and you know yes rookie running backs tend to adapt more quickly to the NFL than many of their compatriots at other positions But Williams is a veteran that's had good success behind a power-based offensive line. Stop me if this sounds familiar. He's coming into that situation. He's certainly going to, pardon the pun, hit the ground running and produce pretty quickly. So if I, again, given this particular situation, which is unique, (laughs) it's got its very own set of circumstances surrounding it, I would probably lean on Jamal Williams because you're going to get him in a value. He's going to be baseline productive. He's not going to be bad in that system. And Kendra Miller is more of a wait and see for me. We'll talk about him when we get to the draft. Uh, Also, by the way, Derek Carr going as QB 19 right now, which seems fair. I think if I had to rank all the quarterbacks for who I thought was best in the NFL, he's not QB 19, but given the offense that he's in, the situation that he's in, I would say QB QB 19 is, is fair from a fantasy perspective. Uh, so once again, if you are trying to value hunt with Saints players and you're doing your best ball drafts and you're trying to you know win that 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 prize pool over in Best Ball Mania Four, which is up to fifteen million dollars, probably just stick to Chris Olave and and let everybody else uh, you know feast on whatever this running back situation is going to be. If you feel compelled to take one, probably go with Jamal. Other than that, draft from literally any other team that's that's probably what i would stick to so uh, again if you already are planning on doing best ball drafts uh, you can use promo code bootleg that'll match your deposit on underdog fantasy up to a hundred dollars obviously there are uh, season long main partner and we appreciate them very much for supporting the show uh, you can get a whole lot of free extra money to use in the platform by using again that promo code bootleg thank you to underdog for making this whole series possible if you've stuck with us the entire time with all these episodes they are the people to thank and we thank them dearly uh all right ej let's get to free agency losses a lot of turnover i don't know how much substantial turnover we have here but lots of players moving on uh marquez calloway is the first one i'm going to highlight he heads on to the broncos doesn't sign a big deal with them but he played a bigger role i think with the saints he might have even left a larger role for a smaller one. Some some players will do that. Adam Troutman goes to the Broncos in a trade, player we liked a lot as a tight end for them. Again, from a sort of fantasy perspective or even an offensive impact perspective, uh, I think his role is growing, but it's not going to be something I feel like they can't replace. Kentavious Street, the edge, goes to the Eagles. 
Caden Ellis, the linebacker, gets a, I would say, bigger than average deal, just over $7 million to move to the Falcons. actually like that move a lot for the division rival Falcons. It will be a loss the Saints feel, but I don't think it's one they didn't see coming. Yeah. So they're not caught unaware, but certainly played very well for them. David Onyemata, you mentioned at the top, defensive lineman, also moves over to the Falcons. So interdivisional shift here. That's interesting to watch. Um, Shai Tuttle, who you mentioned, moves on. He goes to the Panthers. Andy Dalton also goes to the Panthers. Marcus Davenport goes up to the Vikings to help them rebuild their defensive line. He played about 43% of the snaps, only 27 years old. Gets a, I would say, mid-range deal for a defensive lineman at about $13 million. Um, We talked about some of the moves the Saints have made to sort of refurbish that line through the draft. I think they knew they probably weren't going to be able to pay him. So, again, not unexpected. Will they feel it? A little bit. Started to develop. Has a lot of athletic potential and profile um, in terms of overall production on their defensive line. I feel like they have a plan. So, again, lots of movement here. Not too many, like, devastating, oh, what are they going to do about that moves? Well, given the cap situation that they had going into this offseason, they knew that they couldn't keep everybody, right? And especially if they... If they knew um, that they were going after Carr, which, you know, maybe in the beginning of the offseason, they didn't even know that Carr was going to be available. Uh, and, all, all the, of course, he was available. And so that kind of shifted things around for them. But even then, I, I still don't think that they thought they were going to be able to keep Davenport given their, uh, given their financial obligations. And even though the cap isn't real for the Saints, it's real to a degree. It's a little bit... Um, now, where they did spend the money was uh, on keeping a few key players in house. You know, obviously uh, Michael Thomas is still there. His his uh, he's making ten million a year now. Uh, Andrews Pete at five and a half. That one I actually liked. I thought it was pretty good value for him. Mm-hmm. Uh, Malcolm Roach they kept at about a million. Juwan Johnson they kept at about six million, which in the current TE market, not not bad. I mean, again, top end, top end tight ends are probably making over double that by now. Um, so for what he gives you uh, as a receiving tight end in particular, I'm okay with that at $6 million. Uh, but of course, the big, 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 big money <laughs> was spent on outside free agents, uh, in particular Derek Carr making $37.5 million now. And the way they structured that deal with the void years and everything like that, it's classic Mickey Loomis, right, of, yeah, fuck it, void years, that'll fix all of our problems. And it always does. It, it usually does. Uh, and so they're they're kind of kicking the can down the road a little bit again with that deal. But $37.5 million for a top 12 to 15 quarterback in the NFL, given that the top of the market's making 50-something, you know, mid-50s by this time next year, yeah, that's that's totally acceptable. Colin Saunders, they brought in for $4 million. Uh, Jamal Williams, they brought in for four million. Uh, Foster Moreau, they brought in, uh, you know, to kind of be there with his buddy Derek Carr, also at four million. And then John Abram uh, brought in from Seattle about one point one. So again, most of their money spent on outside free agents. Did spend a little bit on a couple uh, key retentions, uh, ch- well, cheap-ish key retentions, and ultimately that was the reason why, uh, especially Davenport, just could not be kept. Yeah, the Malcolm Roach deal for a million bucks I love because of the role he plays. There's some positional value degradation there as a sort of true stump, you know, one to two down nose tackle. Um, But Juwan Johnson, uh, when you combined him with Foster Moreau, you get, you know, two tight ends who can play 1A, 1B, depending on what you're going to do in that offense for a total of 10 million. That's a good value for them. And Derek Carr, yeah, you spend the money because he solidifies a position that they've had trouble with really since Breeze retired. They've been on a, on a rotating search for stability at quarterback or, or efficient production at quarterback. And Carr gives them a much better shot at that, a much more realistic shot at that than anything they've managed to achieve, regardless of where you feel Derek Carr is in terms of the overall power structure of NFL quarterbacks. They don't grow on trees. You get a shot to go get one, um, plug them into what is otherwise a pretty fully featured offense. You got to do it. They did give Carr a little bit of help in the draft as well. Uh, 
Because, again, with a, with a team with the cap situation the Saints do, they really have to hit on their picks. And they do quite often. Uh, you know, that's kind of their only way of getting cheap talent <laughs> with, with, uh, with how much cap fuckery they have to pull off. Like, they really <laughs> have to nail their drafts. And this year, uh, I, I don't know if they nailed it, nailed it. But I do feel like they did uh, at, you know, slightly above average. Like, if I was comparing their draft to uh, the rest of the league, you know, like they, they got some players that I really, really love, you know, especially like Jordan Howen, Jordan Howen late, uh, A.T. Perry late, um, you know, Nick Saldaveri. Uh, it, it was interesting how like, it started out kind of rocky for me just because I wasn't the biggest Percy guy and I wasn't the biggest Foskey or Miller guy. But if we just go from like round four on, I was like, oh, yeah, baby, that's the good stuff. Keep that coming. I like both halves of their draft for different reasons. And again, long term stability in their power structure and their decision making structure leads to a very quote unquote saints draft right they hit their profile whether or not you like their profile or agree with it this felt very saints like top to bottom round one pick 29 brian brissy defensive lineman from clemson was much more dominant earlier in his career at clemson injuries caught up with him a little bit and he had a terrible family situation off field that would have distracted anybody but if you looked again at his most recent tape and availability, you might say, why would they invest a pick so highly? He was the most recruited freshman in the country the year he came into college football. He was the top overall recruit for college football. He has dominant physical skills. If he can return to that both mentally and physically, this pick will be more than worth it. It'll be seen as a value. Round two, pick 40, Isaiah Foskey from Notre Dame, the all-time sack leader at Notre Dame comes and this feels more than anything to me like a Saints pick. Yeah, big, long, strong edge. No bend whatsoever, but they haven't uh, necessarily cared about that historically. Sit Foskey behind Cam Jordan for the last year or two. Say, pick up everything you can. That made sense to me. Again, might not have been the pick I made in the spot. I like Foskey, don't love him. I was like, yep, that's the place for him to go. Round three, pick 71. We talked about Kendra Miller. We said we'd say a little bit more about him, the back out of TCU. Our colleague over at Underdog, Hayden Winks, loved Kendra Miller. Both of us were kind of more, I'd say, whelmed, not necessarily underwhelmed or, or disliked him, but didn't see in him what a lot of other analysts seem to. Um, he was one of those names that hit the, oh, this guy's terribly underrated. He's, he's going to get picked way lower than his ability. And I thought, no, he got picked right about where I see his ability. There were a lot of runs on tape um, where he didn't have to do a whole lot to generate an explosive. That TCU offensive line was was pretty darn good. Um, and I feel like his his one consistent move that he had for breaking tackles, like he's a pretty wicked spin move, uh, which not a lot of running backs in college have like great spin moves. Yeah. He's one of the ones that did. Uh, there was a few flashes of a pretty nifty dead leg, but we didn't get to see it a whole a whole lot. Um, but there were just so many of his, like if you're just doing highlight scouting, there were so many highlights where I'm like, okay, that doesn't really tell me a whole lot because the canyon was 10 feet wide. That one doesn't tell me a whole lot either. Okay, that's a good run. You know, broke a couple tackles, you know, evaded some guys in space against a small school, but fine, whatever, I'll take it. Okay, now we're back to, Canyon, Canyon, Canyon. Like, it, it wasn't me discounting talent or ability. Uh, it's more so because of the offense that he was in. I just, I didn't get to see a whole lot of reps that I felt translated to realistic situations in the NFL where he has to fight for his life in a phone booth, right? And make people miss in small areas, not wide open space. And where, you know, you can't run inside zone and just get gigantic gaps to work with. Um, again, I'm not saying he can't succeed more. So just, there was a lot of film where I'm like, I, I can't really take notes on this cause it's just not realistic. Right. It felt like to me a little bit like our conversation with JT O'Sullivan prior to the draft about quarterback scouting, where he talks about, is that a Sunday throw? And a lot of that translated for me on Kendrick Miller film. Is that a Sunday run? And the answer is no, he's never going to see that in the NFL. If he does, sure. Who can't take advantage of that? Anybody can. What about what he's going to see more often? And you're right, there were fewer and farther between plays where I could really say, oh, okay, that's a skill that translates. Yes, he can do that. I can check that box. 
Um, so I felt like he was good. And look, good running backs go in the third, third round. Third round, yeah. That's so about where they go. That fit for me. Round four, pick 103, offensive tackle, Nick Saldaberry from Old Dominion. One of the guys I got to later in the process. I really like his potential a lot. He's going to need a little bit of time. Saints typically have given offensive linemen time to develop. They're a little bit more patient uh, than some other clubs in the NFL. So I love that fit. Round four, pick 127, QB Jay Kaner. One of my favorite players in this draft. Not in terms of I think he's going to be a great NFL player, just an ultimate sort of gamer that had a ton of production in college that I thought was good production. Struggled with injuries, doesn't have great size. Um, that would justify the round four grade, actually about the first place I would have picked him. Any place below that, it would have been totally comfortable. So Saints were, I'd say right about on time. I won't say early, but any earlier I would have, I would have questioned it. Love the player, love the fit. Uh, I hope he can stay healthy because he is a very dynamic quarterback and a ton of fun to watch if he's healthy and on the field. Round five, pick 146. I'm going to let you talk about Jordan Howden from Minnesota because I was a little bit lower on him. Um, I like some of his attributes, but his overall game, I think you were higher on him. I think he's a do-it-all safety. Um, you know, had to wear a lot of hats in Minnesota. You know, he would uh, cover receivers in quasi-man coverage in quarters deep down the field from a 12-yard shelf, you know, be able to turn and burn with those guys. It's not easy to do because you're basically just giving a receiver a two-way go and a bunch of vertical space. Not a lot of safeties can do that. I felt like he could. You know, he's a great tackler in space, tough against the run. Um, just that kind of that that kind of versatility. Um, and for a defense that plays so much quarters, again, they were seventh in quarters. You need safeties that can hold up in what is essentially man coverage. Or, um, you know, if you drop him down into the slot and you're playing cover one, uh, and he has to take a, a, a really shifty tight end. In man coverage, you need somebody with movement skills who can do that. So I think it's a perfect fit for them. Uh, fifth round was great value, in my opinion. Uh, one of my favorite safeties in this class, if I recall correctly, in terms of pure safeties, not nickels, not corners, but pure safeties. I think I had him as like safety four or five mm. in this class. So getting him in the fifth round was awesome. I'm willing to give New Orleans the benefit of the doubt on players they pick up in the secondary because they've been very good there. Mm -hmm. for a while it's not like one or two they have a very good track record of picking secondary players so whether or not i'm sort of mid or neutral on jordan out and i definitely wasn't negative i'm going to give them the benefit of the doubt and say great landing spot for him to develop round six pick 195 one of our favorite players in the entire draft at perry receiver out of wake forest quick plug if you haven't seen our interview with him from the shrine bowl it's on this channel go check it out just an incredibly advanced mentally advanced offensive player yes in terms of the way he approaches the game the way he understand routes coverages leverages what defenders are trying to do to him what his quarterback's trying to see from him way way ahead of so many of his peers he is a pros pro um and you know there were there were some people uh that were saying that that he dropped because of maturity concerns and i'm i'm like I, I didn't see that. Again, I, I had sure. limited interaction with him compared to strength coaches, teammates, coaches, and even you know the scouts that check in on him throughout the year. But when I first heard that, I was like, really? Like, if you were going to attribute that label to anybody, I was he would be the last one that I expected, right? And just sitting down and talking with him, watching film with him, I did not get anything but the most mature impression of him as a human and as a player so kind of odd but either to the benefit he, of new orleans <laughs> either he has the best poker face in the history of the world or that's bullshit yeah there there is no middle ground there like he is either the best actor he should come out here and make a career in hollywood or that's just one of those labels that gets thrown around carelessly pre-draft and is complete bullshit. I would lean towards the complete bullshit side. think I'm a pretty good judge of character. Again, our interaction was pretty limited, and it is possible. But of all the folks that we talked to, that's the last label I would have applied to him. And there were so many guys that we did ask, or even other receivers that we asked around about, and, and we would get immediate, like, don't. 
nope, do not touch him ever, yeah. right? AT was not one of those guys. He never even got brought up never in those type of conversations. So I don't know, just kind of, kind of a weird little thing there. Yeah. Uh, in terms of undrafted free agents, they did have a pretty nice undrafted free agent haul. Uh, not going to go over all the names here, but in terms of the ones that we think have a pretty decent chance of either making the practice squad or maybe even sneaking onto the roster, uh, Jerron Cage from Ohio State. I know you were a huge fan of him. Nick Anderson from Tulane. Anthony Orgy from Vandy. Uh, and Anthony Johnson, the corner from Virginia. All have a pretty decent shot of surviving here. Okay, I'm going to put a stick in the ground right now. You think Cage makes 53? No. Well, maybe, but that's not the stick I'm putting in the ground. What? Nick Anderson makes his team. Well, considering what their linebacker depth chart looks like, that one actually wouldn't shock me. So Nick Anderson uh, played next to Dorian Williams at Tulane. He is the shorter, sawed off, but sometimes even more effective player. And we love his running mate. He caught my eye over and over and over again on tape, enough that I went back and did an individual study on him even though I was pretty sure he wasn't going to get drafted with his measurables because he is not tall. He does not have long arms. He's not super fast in time speed on the field. He is very, very quick, very quick mentally, which makes him appear that much faster on the field. Extremely tough, makes a ton of plays, reminds me very favorably of Drake Thomas. I was linebacker. just going to say his He name. <laughs> reminded me so much of Drake Thomas. I was like, here's another Drake Thomas playing with a more heralded player right next to him. And is short in stature, quick, instinctive, impactful in, in every phase of the game, except for maybe deep pass coverage. If you're running a system where your linebackers independently can rotate and need to pick up slot guys all the time, he's not going to be your favorite. New Orleans has had success with linebackers like him before. Um, he gets to play for his hometown team, having gone to Tulane. Love his game. Almost nobody talked about him. Complete dark horse. I'm going to say he at least makes the practice squad on this team. He is he is paid by New Orleans this year to play football. With all of that said, that now brings us to our final report card, where we give either upgrades, downgrades, or flat even grades to four different categories. Front office, coaching, offensive personnel, and defensive personnel. And we're essentially grading the trend over the off season relative to last year in those four categories. Front office, we're gonna give up. They upgraded a quarterback on a deal that is fairly manageable given how cap structures work. Uh, you know, they were able to say goodbye to really only one key piece um, and retain a bunch of others and sign a bunch of others. So great job by Mickey Loomis again. One of the best GMs in the NFL, again. Speaking of poker players, didn't drop any draft picks to get him. Yes. And that was not necessarily a thing at the beginning of this saga. You mentioned, oh, they might not know he's available. Then it came out that he would be available, but for picks. Held firm. Poker stare bluff. Yeah. Go ahead, do it. Well, the Raiders wanted Carr to approve the trade, and Carr said, no, release me. And slightly spiteful from Carr of like, no, I'm going to make you eat this and not get any benefit from losing me. Uh, but again, to the benefit of the Saints. <laughs> Mickey Loomis just scrapes all the chips from the middle of the table, which is great. Uh, coaching, we're going to go flat even because this is as stable a franchise as stable franchises can be. Yeah. Uh, that is neither negative nor positive. Offense, we're going to go up on personnel. Uh, Derek Carr, obviously, way better. Uh, a, a quarterback option than Andy Dalton or Jameis Winston or basically anybody since like right before the last year of Breeze where his arm was like clearly dead, right? This is the best quarterback they've had in a pretty significant number of years. Um, if Michael Thomas is healthy and even 60% of what he was before, very solid wide receiver two for them. And of course, uh, with Alaba being the ascending wide receiver one, their overall offensive personnel, Camara or no Camara, is better this year. And then uh, finally, defense. A little bit of rotation in terms of the names we're going to be seeing this year, but still uh, should be just as good and just as effective. So we're going to give that an even score as well.
yeah, newcomers have to step up, but they got some very good newcomers. So, and they have an excellent defensive coach. So the chances of that happening are really good. I'm going to quick shout out to Rashid Shahid on offense too. So that's just a, that's just a drop. He's in explosive. For all, all the Saints fans can't get through a whole episode about the Saints and not mention Rashid Shahid. He's fun. So overall, you know, if you're going through four categories and nothing is going down, that's a pretty good off season. Uh, and that brings us to ceiling and floor, because again, this was a seven and 10 team last year. Mm -hmm. If we think that they've only improved, what's the ceiling this year? For me, my floor is seven, because again, I can't imagine them being worse than they were last year, barring some sort of catastrophic string of injuries, right? Um, so I think I think last year was the floor, and that's seven. And for me, for me, my ceiling is going to be slightly ahead of the Falcons. I had a nine-win ceiling for the Falcons. I think the Saints have a ten-win ceiling because again, better, more stable quarterback situation, and they do have plenty of talent around Carr. My ceiling is going to be nine. It's about the same as I gave the Falcons, which would be the same as it was this year, and winning the same number of games. I think they'll improve. Again, they were seven-win team last year. They had a good defense. They're going to have to work to maintain that defense. We talked about some of the changeover. I think they can do that. I think they can be better on offense. I think neither one of us think Alvin Kamara has a very good chance to play. It's possible he does. They still have a lot of weapons on offense, but it feels a little bit um, Arizona cardinals a couple of years ago where the top tier of talent, both along the offensive line and in the skill positions, is good at first blush. Behind that, it's a little thin. Injuries could keep this team from ascending if that's the case and Carr just doesn't mesh and the new pieces on defense don't get up to speed quickly enough. I would say six wins is my floor. And that would be a disappointing season for Saints fans. But again, I want to reiterate, uh, just like the Falcons, they're not bad enough to, to be in the Caleb sweepstakes. They're not bad enough to be in the May sweepstakes. That's why they got Carr in the first place is they knew this team was not in any – position to tank it's too good uh, they would have had to have a legendary fire sale uh, to even to even be in position to be a bottom five team in the nfl so uh, they decided just put their foot in the gas and go for it you know the hardest way hardest way out is through that's their mantra always uh, and i think eventually we will see the saints get back to their former glory but it might not be this year they still might be a year or two away uh, and they're so. going to be very watchable very watchable. This Very is going to be an entertaining team that gives opposing teams a game every week. Again, because of that defense, that defense will not be bad, mm -hmm. right? It could be good to very good, depending on how quickly the newcomers acclimate. But this is, even on offense, this team is not going to be boring. It is not going to be bad. It is going to be somewhere in the middle. Could be good middle if all the pieces mesh quickly. So Saints fans, I realize that, you know, predicting either low double digit or not quite double digit win totals feels like oh they hate the saints don't hate the saints they're gonna they're gonna be a factor in that cardinals division. fans would kill for that right now <laughs> <laughs> there are many fans who have it worse than you gonna be an exciting team i think certainly on offense you're gonna be able to see a little bit more consistency this year um with the changes they've made that's a good thing so you know we like new orleans we think it's probably another year until they're competing against the top powers in the conference but they're going to be a good solid fun watchable team this year we'll be back tomorrow talking carolina speaking of good solid fun watchable teams with potentially double digit win upsides uh the nfc south is uh nothing if not a bloodbath and carolina is going to contribute to that as well uh, if you're a saints fan also make sure to come back on friday where we predict a division winner uh which is going to be extraordinarily difficult yes. all these teams are going to be within two games of each other again uh so yeah come back same time same place tomorrow talking carolina panthers and until then later